Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, um, uh, welcome to our webinar, Drop IOL and Afeka Surgery. How do I do it? Uh, this is Ahmed Saleh from Arkansas, US, and it's my uh, great pleasure to welcome my colleagues and my friends uh, who are joining us uh, in this webinar. Uh, to start, uh, I would like to welcome um, Dr. Christopher Raymond from Cincinnati, USA. Christopher, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. And uh, my colleague from the UK, Aman Chandra from Southend. Aman? Good evening. Good evening, all. And my um, and the next uh, presenter is Dr. Abdullah El Aban from Hull, UK. Abdullah, welcome. Hi, pleasure to be here with you today. And our next speaker from Manchester, UK, is Philippe uh, um, uh, Dwahir Scala. Philippe, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Ahmed, and uh, it's nice to be here sharing this with all of you. So hopefully it will be exciting. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, our um, we'll speak now. Uh, first thing about uh, the discussion is more about uh, aphakia and dropped IOL. So I'd like to kickstart uh, by discussing um, surgery for removing dropped IOL. So I will start by Christopher here, but this is the classic technique where we go with the forceps, pick it up, and then bring it in the NT chamber, and then retrieve it uh, from there. Uh, so, uh, Chris, if you can uh, show us uh, your technique for doing this. I'll be more than happy to. One moment. So, um, one second, I'll just bring it up here. Okay. Okay, yes, you're on there. So I've got two short videos. Uh, one is kind of a medley. Uh, one is kind of a medley on, on how, to, uh, how, to, how to lift these lenses. Um, so, you know, here's a, a lens that's loose. It's entangled in the vitreous. The first thing you have to do is really make sure that the IOL is free floating and, and, and disentangled from the vitreous. So here we finally got it out of the vitreous space. And this, this video is 15 years old. You see it's standard definition. And I'm doing this case 25 gauge. And this is before we had 25 gauge dual bores. I'm using perfluoron and a forcep, uh, taking the lens and uh, floating the lens up. That's the old fashioned way to do it. Um, since then, I've migrated towards using the forceps the way uh, 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 Dr. Salam just showed. But I've even stopped using the forceps. I just use suction from the cutter now. And that's very, very, very powerful. As long as you put the, uh, the, the, the mouth of the cutter into the optic haptic junction, you can bring the IOL with just suction from the cutter up into the retropupillary space and then use a light pipe to push it into the anterior chamber. It's very nice, it's very powerful, and it works really well. Um, and another uh, another for, another uh, video that's nice to uh, use. And, uh, you can even do this with. Uh, you can even use suction from just a 27 gauge cutter. So here's an IOL uh, capture bag complex, and we've just kind of pushed it through the pupil with the light pipe using a 27 gauge cutter. It's very powerful, and uh, and as the uh, you just have to be sure to turn the cutter port off. And get the uh, an either engage capsule or summerings ring if there's a if it's an IOL capsule bag complex, or put it uh, put the cutter mouth into the into the angle between the uh, into the angle between the optic and the haptic, and it works very well to lift these. Thank you so much. That's uh, that's great. Uh, so can I have just a quick discussion from the. Um panel here about uh, what's their preferred method for picking up a dropped IOL. So, Felipe, what do you do? Do you use the forcep or do you use the cutter or the suction? Well, it, it, it depends, uh, Amit. The very, very nice videos, Chris. Um, I've never used PFCL. Uh, again, I, I never use it anyway or I minimize the use of that. I use either um, the forceps or the cutter. And uh, I moved on from you know, uh, 25, 23 gauge a while ago, now to 27 gauge. And uh, probably as Chris uh, has shown as well, uh, it's it's very, very easy, especially in these lenses that are encapsulated to uh, produce a significant amount of suction on the capsular bag to bring the lens upwards. Sometimes, and I'll show that in a video next, uh, I do a kebab technique. Uh, and that's as I lift the lens out, 
uh, up, I puncture it with the light pipe just to stabilize myself and then bring that up and I've got just a little bit more stability and then with the forceps from the anterior chamber, I try to drag one haptic out and then the optic and the other haptic. I'll, I'll show that in the next video. So. Very nice. And man, what do you do? Forceps, suction? Uh, I've only ever used forceps. So I've, I've, forceps. Uh, I've, I've not used the, form, the suction before. I suppose the advantage of the suction is that <clears throat> there's no risk of you pushing on the IOL onto the, or less risk. Yeah. Like of you pushing the IOL onto the onto the retina, which is a nice a nice thing to consider. Um, I've never used PFL, but I, I am I am younger than Chris, so it, it is um. Abdullah, <laughs> 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 what do you do? Forceps or? Yes, I usually use the forceps. Actually, the common scenario we come across these cases now is usually dropped IOL within the capsular back complex, especially mm -hmm. in those exfoliation and usually get a tough fibrous capsule so if you grab it from the fibrous capsule and they usually shake bring it anteriorly shake it to another forceps and then take it to bring it to the ac either cut it or retrieve it through a spiral tunnel Thank you. I, think, I think one point if you don't mind me saying ahmed is that it's important when you use forceps especially with encapsulated lenses is to use wide mouthed forceps because yeah. there are, especially in 27 gauge, you have the small biting ones that, that you can't grip properly. And the ones that have a wide opening, these are the ones that are important. So yes. to keep in mind when using this. Yeah. Well, and, and, there, and there are no 27 gauge forceps that open wide, uh, at least not that I've found. A modified Eckerd one that opens really wide. Is that right? Okay. Yes, it's, yeah, I think it's from Dork. Uh, from Dork, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Dork, you have a wide, a wide, um, it reopens really wide. So, I think to summarize the important points here, especially for the uh, new surgeons, uh, when you use a forceps, which is the most classic, don't really push the lens into the retina because there's a bit of a habit that to get a good grasp, you push into the lens and try to get it, get it easier from the optic, uh, haptic junction uh, and use a wider forceps, particularly if you're using 27 gauge suction or. Uh, extrusion cannula is a nice way of getting it, but make sure you keep your foot down as you bring it up in the anti chamber because at some point you may lose your suction and it will fall down. Right, that's great. Uh, let's move on to different lenses and what we do with different lenses. We have a, a variety of lenses. So I'm showing here uh, just uh, this is a, a picture courtesy of Dr. Abdallah Laban showing the different types of lenses. We have anti chamber IOLs. We have iris supported IOL, and also for completion, you can suture an IOL in the iris. And we have different ways of doing sphere fixation uh, intraocular lenses. So uh, to start, I'll show here the uh, uh, the technique of anterior uh, chamber IOL. Uh, very very important not to forget to do the peripheral iridectomy in anterior chamber IOL. Uh, so always remind someone to remind you, the fellow or the nurse or the scrub tech, to remind you to do an anti-chamber IOL. And then you want to use a uh, viscoelastic to protect the cornea. And then I tend to use a glide and make sure that the glide is not picking the iris as you go into the angle, as you can see here. So you want to really go into the angle. And if you push on the glide here, it will lift up and go into the angle. And some, then some viscoelastic on top of the glide. And then the lens now goes in, and as it goes in, you're pushing slightly down on the glide as the lens is going in. And now just make sure that you clear the glide, you, you're on the glide, you're clearing the iris, and as you push in, you pull the glide out. And now the trick is here. You don't want to need to push it inside, but you want to push inside and under the wound, and you best at the beginning, especially for again new uh, surgeons, to lift and make sure that your haptic is not in the wound. So make clear the haptic is not in the wound. And then if you have any distortion of the pupil, best to sort that after you suture. And all what you need to do is just lift up uh, left centrally and up towards the cornea and then let go. And that will clear any iris attached to the, uh, to the, um, um, to the lens and will clear any peak. So, Aman, you have another case to show as well, and then we can have discussion. So until uh, Dr. Chandra loads up, um, um, 
Uh, Chris, do you use anti-chamber IOL? Um, rarely. Uh, I'm pretty facile with sutured posture chamber lenses. Um, a lot of my patients are uh, quite a bit older. Uh, uh, so you can make the argument that maybe we should be using the uh, anterior chamber lenses, uh, but uh, the older lens, the older patients also have decreased endothelial cell counts. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty facile. I use them when I have to, there's nothing wrong with them. I just really like putting the lens behind the iris. And right. it's, um, you know, it's a personal preference. There is absolutely nothing wrong with a well-placed anterior chamber intraocular lens. I think, the, you know, but, you but it's not just shoving the lens in the eye. You have to know how to do that surgery. You have to measure the white to white. You have to sometimes rotate the lens so that, so that the, uh, the cord length of the lens appropriately matches the white to white. It's a little more complicated than just shoving a lens into the eye. And, uh, and, and I'm glad that you, that, that, that you showed that technique. It's fabulous. Uh, uh, thank you so much. And I think we'll have uh, more discussion with Abdallah and Philippi about the review of anti chamber IOL. And also that point of white white is a very interesting point. Amen, please proceed. Well, to be honest, I'm, I mean, you've kind of showed everything that I like to do. So I, I'd like to make a large incision. So this is going for temporarily. I think we've obviously been trained the same way, but I, I like to make a large, uh, proper three-step incision. So with a backward facing, uh, feather blade to make a um, incision, and then I like to use a crescent blade to really make a, a, a very well-defined step in that wound. Um, I, I, the, if you make these wounds properly, they're less likely to leak. And then, as you described, using a sheet slide, which is, it gives you some sort of ideas to where to put the eye well. It's important to know which way to put it, and this is the wrong way. If you see an S, that's the wrong way to put an ACL. That's the correct right. orientation. Um, and it's going to be vaulted forward like that. So that's vaulted forward. And then you see, there we are. It's on the sheet slide. That's the correct way. That's not the S. S for stop. That's not the S. That's a Z for Zorro. Zorro is good. Yeah. Um, and then you, um, as, as Ahmed so nicely um, and more obviously elegantly than I am demonstrating, put the IOL in to the, um, into the, into the, um, into the AC. And then in this particular circumstance, I then went superiorly to, um, to do the peripheral iridotomy. Um, you can go from the front, uh, so from the top, I'm not going to show that, but if you go from superiorly, I do like to manipulate the eye. We do measure it white to white horizontally, so I like to put the eye well in horizontally. So if you're going from the top, such as in a, in a vitrectomy like here, here we put the eye well in with a sheet slide similar to before. Now, as Ahmed described, I like to go up to the optic, lift, pull, lift, and drop. Pull, lift, and drop, and then you're more, you're more likely to get it into the right part of the, of the angle. And then a push and pull, to rotate the IOL so that it's horizontally, push and pull, and then you, you, then you have it in a, in a horizontal plane um, in the anterior chamber. Oop, there we are. That's my videos. Thank you much. So, uh, Felipe, do you measure white to white or do you use a large anti chamber IOL? For, do you do AC IOL? Uh, well, I, I stopped doing AC IOLs probably from 2010. And as Chris mentioned, you know, I think we have much better options nowadays uh, than to put something that, you know, it's a little bit too close to the endothelium of the cornea, it wobbles. Uh, so I think that in, in view of the other options that we, we, we have now, I, I, I've not put one in the last 10 years, but I used to, you know, measure the white to white and the diameter where, you know, we were going to introduce the lens uh, and, and very similar technique to, to, to all of you. But it's definitely not something that I offer nowadays actually to anyone. Right. And Abdallah, what do you do? Do you use ACIOL still? Oh, you're muted, Abdallah. Abdallah, we cannot hear you. You're muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, actually, I stopped doing them about five, six years ago because now we have many more options than in the past. So I usually go to a uh, retrobiliary artisan or a sphere fixed lens. Okay, so quick uh, word from everyone. Uh, so Felipe, you do artisan and sphere fixation, correct? And you will show us more on that. Yeah. And Chris, you do sphere fixation. There's no artisan, unfortunately, in the US. I use, a, I, I, I like the seven millimeter optic, the, the CZ70 uh, rigid PMMA lens. One, one comment I wanted to make that I really enjoyed in all of the ACIOL videos is that everybody made ample wounds. 
Um, in one of my videos a little bit later, you'll see I was stingy with a wound because it was an anti, a doubly anticoagulated patient. And, uh, and, and I was stingy with the wound. And when you're stingy with the wound size, then you suffer getting the lens into the eye. That's true. Uh, make, make the wound as big as you think you need and then make it a bit bigger. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Same advisory when getting a foreign body out of the eye or putting a reticert in. That's the usual advice for all these three things. And I think a man and me will still do anti-chamber IOL and will also do some square fixation lens. I, I think if you look at the evidence, the evidence for, uh, for, for the bad press that anterior chamber lenses yes, got true, I agree. was from a long time ago. And actually the modern modern ACRLs, which are well measured, are actually very good for the they're not bad for the endothelium, probably no worse than iris fixed lens, which, which wobble. You get wobble on the iris, you get pigment dispersion. Yep. And it's so you actually do get some endothelial loss with iris fixation. I think it's posterior fixated lenses that are probably the best for the corneal endothelium, and I'd put those in a young guy. But if my patients are elderly, which a lot on the south coast of England are, then um, this is a nice, quick, um, quicker operation for me. Right. Philippe, do you want to get uh, ready with your videos? Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to... Okay, here we go. Where are we? Yep. Yeah. I'm getting there. So, so, so. First video is, this is something that I want to show if you don't mind, Ahmed, because again, sometimes it's yeah. about the support of left. You know, when we have some complicated cataract surgery, we think that everything is lost. Remember that there might be hope always. Uh, and light at the end of the tunnel. So this is a patient with a very small pupil. I think he has uh, he had pseudo exfoliation. He had a complicated cataract surgery. He came to me. I usually try and leave a secondary eye oil for a little bit later. I leave them, you know, two three weeks, four weeks, if possible. And there is no dropped uh, lens. Can, can you make the your uh, your your video bigger? Can you enlarge the video? Yes. So I'm doing uh, hooks here. And oops. Oh. Sorry. I'm doing the the green. Apple, Apple F. Okay, so as, as you can see here, look, this is a patient that was sent to me to to put a you know or a pupillary lens in, and when I enlarged the pupil, he had enough capsular support to be able to put a sulcus lens. So I just wanted to show this to remind people that uh, this is an option that we should not explore before you know starting to stick anything you know clip to the iris or, or or the sclera, which is basically the most one of the most anatomical uh, options after the posterior capsule, you know, after a, post, a posterior capsule uh, intraocular lens. So next, uh, I'm going to show you, and this is also something that I don't do that much anymore, uh, since, because again, as you mentioned, I prefer always to go behind the iris, because it's the most anatomical position and it's near the nodal point and the best clear or and clearest images that the eye will get in, in that position. So this is an anterior chamber uh, clipped lens, an artisan lens. It's a, a simple procedure to get the lens in. Remember also, as we mentioned, to have a wide, big wound about 5.5 millimeters. And the reason for this is that you don't want to be shoving and struggling and, you know, making your life difficult. So just make your life easy in these cases um, and then rotate it in whichever meridian you think is best. Remember this also, this lens, the artisan lens is concave. So it, there is a tilt to it. So you need to, depending whether you're inserting it into the anterior chamber or posterior chamber, you need to put the concavity of the lens away from, 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 the, from the iris. Uh, so, uh, once you position the lens in, a, in the correct uh, meridian that you want, uh, you just hook it to the two clipped arms. Uh, this is what I started, which again, we didn't have an instrument called VacuFix, uh, which, and that's why I had to use a mushroom or you could use an iris dialer. But now they make a special type of uh, vacuum that you attach it to the machine and you can suck some of the iris up and hook it and, and, and clip the lens onto it. So I don't have, unfortunately, a video of that because as I said, I, I leave the anterior chamber uh, 
I, I try and stay clear of the anterior chamber when, when we're, we're doing these I, things. I have a video for that. If there's time at the end, we can show it. That's, that's perfect. Yeah. So, uh, and next is a posterior artisan lens. This is a combined video which is showing uh, basically the retrieval of dislocated intracor lens in within a bag. As you can see, I'm using a 27 gauge here. I'm trying to aspirate. The nice thing with 27 gauge is that you can get very close to the to the to the retina, and uh, that's why you're less likely to end up hitting the, the retina. And obviously, that comes with it, with experience. Once you've lifted it to the vacuum, I do the kebab technique here, as you can see. So I'm trying to put the light pipe through the capsule. This is edited. That lens dropped uh, once or twice before until I kebabbed it. And then you basically, you, you, you can see that you stabilize the lens a little bit uh, in, in the anterior segment. And then with some forceps, these are not the long uh, mouth forceps that I was talking about. I think this was before that era. And basically, I externalize one haptic, enlarge the wound again. You see, this is very important to enlarge the wound, make our lives easy. Uh, and you can see now that the lens put always remember to put heel on. You don't want to be, you know, doing a lot of manipulation in the anterior chamber. Just also make, make space uh, to be able to maneuver safely and we're just going now to remove the lens and also with the 27 gauge cutter uh, that i use the eva machine from dork uh, i've used all the 27 gauge uh, uh cutters you know from alcon from from dork which are and and, and bao shalom and i think it's the most efficient uh, one uh in terms of you know eating out remnants and even removing lens fragments. Um, so you can see that there is quite a bit of capsule with fibrosis left behind, and it's attached to the to the to one of the haptics. Pepe, sorry, can I interrupt you here? So, uh, is your infusion on or off as you pull that out? Because that's usually a bit of a, a tricky bit, right? Sometimes if you leave it on, then the iris prolapses. What do you do? Totally correct, and this is this is also making your life difficult. So I, I tend to have, that's why I put heel on in as much as possible and do minimal manipulation and I keep the infusion off uh, at this stage while I'm trying to externalize the intracoral lens. Yep. Once I have a stable anterior chamber again, like now, I tend to put the infusion back on. Yep. Yeah, good so point. Lens out, and now I'm going to introduce a posterior artisan lens. So you've one of the things that we need to do is two little, can you see my cursor here? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so I do two little incisions on the side of where I'm going to uh, clip the lenses. Um, I use Helon GV or high viscosity viscoelastic. I also put myopole to make sure that the pupil is at its smallest uh, uh, aperture. And again, five and a half millimeter diameter, you know, uh, corneal wound. Remember, I'm showing here that the lens is concave. So I'm putting the concavity away from the iris. So you need to remember to turn the lens upside down. And also remember that the A constant calculation for this type of introduction is going to be different from the normal artisan lens that we introduce in the anterior chamber. Yeah. Once it's in place, uh, you dial it wherever you want to dial. You can use, you know, whatever. It's because sometimes you have iris uh, missing or so you can find the areas where the iris is the chunkiest and most stable. And uh, basically, uh, we introduce the second instrument first to avoid collapsing. At this stage, the, the infusion is off. And you rotate, pick up the lens near the haptic that you're going to clip and lift, uh, then push it behind the iris. And then you lift it up to have an imprint on the iris. And then you basically have to use some imagi imagination as well as seeing where the haptic is and hook it. All this comes with experience. All this sometimes seems very simple, straightforward. And believe me, the first few cases you struggle, but it comes with experience. Once you have hooked one of the haptics in that position, make sure that you don't drag the lens to the side or to the other. That's where 
the other haptic will need to be uh, uh, clipped to make sure that you get as much of a round pupil as, as possible. So here we're in, again, push, pull, uh, lift upwards and hook backwards. And that's a beautiful lens. You know, it's, it's, uh, I've done probably over, over 400 cases now. And uh, as I said, my initial experience was tough uh because there was a lot of manipulation which induced some cmo but afterwards uh with experience there is less manipulation and also the post-op regime of treatment that you give you learn that as well to make sure that you minimize the amount of inflammation the cmo and now the rates of cmo have reduced dramatically in comparison to what i had in my first 30 40 cases so these are the, the these are the techniques one of the two techniques that that uh i i use so Philippi, thank you so much. This is uh, really very nice. Let's see what uh, how Abdullah does it, and then after that we can have some discussion about the placement of the lens and uh, which part facing the iris again. Just to recap, when you put a posterior, Abdullah. Yeah, I do very similar technique to Philippi actually. So initially, I start, I plan it, I do a, a good peripheral iridectomy, uh, then then I after that I prepare the cornea, do a good marking, usually three, nine uh, meridians. And after that, I go to the lens. I like to flip it uh, on its rack, make sure it's nicely flipped, check the angle as well. Once it's flipped, I insert it in a similar way. So Abdallah, Abdallah can you tell us more about the angle? So you want the lens to be wherever you put it away from the iris, right? Yes, yes, yes. Because the, ang the lens has a little bit of slight angulation. So, so the vault is away from the iris. Yes. Whether you put it anteriorly, so it's vaulting away, or you put it posteriorly, so it's vaulting away. This is the iris, is vaulting away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you yeah. vault away from the iris. And people, there are people who do not do peripheral iridectomy, but it seems that Abdullah and Felipe do peripheral iridectomy. And I used to do peripheral iridectomy as well when I used to do them in the UK. Yes. Sorry, Ahmed. I, I, I stopped doing PIs oh, okay. for the last year, and I found that again because logically, you have an, you you have enough space there to avoid having a pupil block, and I've not had any cases coming back. But again, you know, I'll wait for that that um, one. I Excellent. think it's really important. Felipe mentioned in passing that the A constant when you when you put it behind the iris, you've got to be careful not just to use the the A constant. Felipe mentioned there, and it's really important when when you yeah. start not to. Just assume you order the, the same IOL as you would if you're putting the iris clip lenses in the front of the eye. Uh, Felipe has already mentioned that, but it's a really important point to, to consider. So we talked about the vault and the IOL calculations. Abdullah, can you please proceed? Yeah, one quick thing to mention. Yeah. Actually, when you do the biometry, you can uh, select that in the biometry. So you can select retrobibillary artisan, and it gives you the exact uh, mm -hmm. constant and exact calculation. If you plan to do it retrobibillary from the beginning. Right. Good. So once uh, the lens is uh, correct in radian, I hold it from the center. So I'm holding it now with my right hand, and I made two small uh, baricentesis at three and nine. I put it behind, and with any lacrimal cannula, I just tuck it, make sure it's nicely tucked. So this is, I engage the first haptic. This is a really important tip. I'd like to sweep the iris a little bit. This is really useful when you try to engage the second haptic behind the lens. So now I'm holding the lens with my left hand and push it gently behind the iris. Once it's behind the iris, with the lacrimal cannula with the other baricentesis, I tuck it and I make sure I get a good tuck. This is usually about 5.5 to 6 millimeter incision. So usually I spend some time uh, holding that incision with about usually two or three sutures. And I've tried to make the sutures gentle just to avoid any astigmatism. And as you can see, this option is very nice. It takes just 10, 15 minutes maximum to sort uh, this lens in place to conclude the surgery. And one good tip also to be very gentle when you do the final irrigation aspiration at the end. So at the time, just gently, just very gentle with the IA. Uh, and actually, the Peripheral iridectomy helps in that situation because sometimes the pupil and the lens may block each other, so you get sudden deepening 
of the entire chamber. And yeah, and then we conclude the session. Thank you so much. Uh, that's a very elegant uh, presentation, Abdallah, and very elegant presentation, Philippi. So a quick question here for uh, Philippi. So um, do you think dilating the pupil later on for retina examination is safe with artisan IRL? It's a, a usually a question that people tend to ask. Yeah, well, I, th I think, again, it's perfectly feasible. Remember that that lens is anchored in the mid-periphery of the iris and it shouldn't interfere with the action of the sphincter pupil or the dilator. So I've never encountered any 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 problems from, from that point of view. One thing, if you don't mind me, Ahmed, mentioning that yeah. the forceps are a specific long-tongued forceps to be able to manipulate those lenses. Not any forceps will... Uh, will will be able to manipulate those lenses uh, uh, appropriately, and uh, also one thing I do differently, also from you know from 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 before, is that I tend to use vicral sutures nowadays uh, as well, which again they dissolve, uh, they're not going to last there for a long time, and also that that it has a less impact on on probably the the amount of tightening and astigmatism in the long in the long run of of of, of you know the corneal wound. And uh, oh, oh, one thing also I wanted to ask, I, do, I tend to always have an anterior chamber maintainer in these cases, just to make sure that I have control always uh, and make that I, you know, that the eyes, the pressure, it's pressurized under my control. Is that something that you tend to do or, or not? I, I, I used not to put them behind the iris. I used to put them on anterior chamber, so I didn't do that. Uh, Abdallah, if you're not doing a vitrectomy, do you use anti-chamber uh, maintainer? Uh, in some cases, but sometimes I just use just uh, high viscosity, viscoelastic. It usually works well. But I think it's a very good advice, especially uh, for starting surgeons. If you don't have an infusion, maybe best to use an AC maintainer. You're in a better control of the pressure. Can, can I, my, my experience of these lenses, actually, and I'd, I'd like to hear what you think, is actually putting it behind the iris. Perversely, I think is easier than, than putting them on the on the. My experience is that actually it's, it's not intuitively you might be more anxious, but actually I think it's easier to put it behind and push up, and then you get the imprint, which is very nice, to then pop the iris through the haptic. Whereas pushing down, you tend to be pushing the iris away, and then you have to suck with the vacuum fix. Do, do you feel the same? I mean, you you presumably don't do them in the front anymore, so you. I I, I think from my point of view they all have a learning curve. Uh, the anterior chamber, when I started, was a little bit tricky uh, to fix the iris, but also the posterior, uh, you know, the retropopillary clip lens, I used to struggle to start with because of that manipulation on the tilt, and you used to push down, lose the anterior chamber, the eye collapsing. As I said, now it comes more natural, it's easier, it's now I don't look back, but I think the first few cases, I find it a little bit more tricky. And the fellows that are with me tend to find it a little bit more tricky to start with with posterior rather than anterior. Okay, so I have a question for Ahmed. Pardon? I have a question for Ahmed. Yes, please. Um, I, every time I see these artisan lenses go in, I'm so uh, I'm I'm so impressed by how slick the surgery is and how minimally invasive and how beautiful the anatomy ends up. And, uh, and, and I've done a, a fair amount of, of travel for Europe. Um, uh, uh, Ahmed, I don't have these lenses. You're the only one here that's had them and lost them. How important do you think it would be to bring these into the United States? Do you think that it's important or what, what's your thought? Uh, I think the, they are good to have, but to be honest, uh, I think they can be replaced by anti-chamber IOL and uh, and square fixation, but they are easier than square fixation. Mm. So I think it would be lovely to have them, especially now with the uh, custom iris that you will show us. I think they go very well with it as well. You can, you know, combine the two. So I think it's good to have that too. Um, and uh, I just want to say that actually anterior chamber fixation and anterior uh, fixation of the iris suit of the artisan is much, much easier. As Philippe mentioned earlier with the VAC fix, the VAC fix makes it very, very easy. So 
Uh, we'll try if we have time to show a video on that. But I just want to show here, uh, this is... One thing, Ahmed, while we put the video on, can I just say also that one of the things that drew, I mean, put me back from using these lenses into the interior chamber nowadays is that these lenses were designed to clip with a lens behind. So you had a very stable iris diaphragm. Uh, once you remove that lens from behind in an fake type of scenario, it's what Aman uh, mentioned before. I worry about how much wobbling there is back, backwards and forwards. And I don't know the long run in a young patient what the impact is going to be. That's why I also <clears throat> am happy at putting it behind. So it's, if it falls, again, we remove lenses from the posterior uh, chamber. So if... I've not had also in more than 400 plus cases. I've only had my second case that dislocated, uh, and it was one ha one of the haptics, one of the uh, clips, and that was because the guy the day after opened the cupboard and banged his eye basically and dislocated the lens traumatically. So, so they're quite they're fairly stable, fairly stable. I think there is there is some data on endothelial cell loss from anterior fixed lenses because there is a lot of iridogenesis. I mean, I, I, and uh, it may not bang up against the cornea, but there, there is certainly, you know, there's yeah. a lot of organesis and some pigment dispersion at the time. These are a really great point, and uh, it's best to dislocate posteriorly than anteriorly. So the take-home <laughs> message is, well, can I ask, can I ask, your uh, head again is the cupboard, if you had an artisan IRL. Can I just ask the question? So post-operative regime for you guys, I um, mean, you touched on it. Presumably you give them a lot of intensive steroids if you're manipulating the iris. Well, I mean, I started, again, my first few cases, I used to treat them with normal, like, steroids four times a day, you know, and the uh, chloramphenic, you know, or uh, antibiotic. Then I found that my in incidence of cystoid macroedema was high. So now I treat them very aggressively. I treat them for two weeks with two hourly steroids mm -hmm. and then reduce that to four times a day for another six weeks. I add to that an anti-inflammatory such as Yelox or Acular twice a day for six weeks and the, the antibiotic for two weeks. But I do I do agree that I, I treat them, and that's also, I think, has made an impact on the reduction of, of cystoid macroedema. So the manipulation with the experience, the less manipulation with the experience, and the, the aggressive or intense regime afterwards, I think, made, made a difference. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah, I totally agree. The minimal manipulation is the best way uh, to achieve a good outcome. And as you know, when the technique of retrobiobiliary artisan was initially described, people tend to put the whole lens behind the iris and then engage one iris and then swap hands, engage the iris. So this is tend to irritate the iris a little bit. But once you put one at a time and keep it in front of the iris till you go back and do the second, engage the second uh, haptic, that often tend to cause less iris manipulation or iris trauma. Right, thank you, Abdullah. Uh, so we we put these lenses, but sometimes we have to use it, this, to have to remove it. This is a patient who had the lens in the proper way, as Philippi was describing, a fake uh, uh, artisan intraocular lens, but then she went on to develop cataract, which was mainly anterior, and she was in her late 40s, so in relation to the lens. So here I'm doing cataract surgery and I want to remove the lens first. So I was thinking easy, I hold, I do the same way like I've put them. So I hold to the center and I try to disengage the iris. And I'm trying here again. But the problem is the lens is tilting and I'm really not able to get it out. So more viscoelastic. And I, I thought, okay, well, let's try from the other side. Maybe the other side would be easier. And I'm trying here crossing over and not going so well at all. And then I figured out actually, maybe I need to hold nearer. And then when you hold nearer, it becomes very easy. So they, if you need to remove one of these, that's the way to do it. Just hold very near and then it really would not tilt, which makes sense. But I, I think until you're shown that, it just becomes tricky. Um, so, yeah, it's not nice, nice. yeah, and that's, uh, I didn't find any literature on that, but I think it's something that I learned myself, really. So you hold near and then it tends to work. Can, can I also suggest, Hamid, maybe Please. it's also a good thing 
to use maybe an iris hook or something a little bit less, you know, uh, thick than the cannula that you, you were using to be able to bypass that that clip area. So that, that's that's why I do uh, this type of thing. Chris, if you can get ready, please, with your uh, um, presentation. Uh, so now we're changing gears. We're going to, uh, we talked about ACIL, artisan, anterior and posterior, and also removing the artisan. And now let's go to square fixation. Uh, people like square fixation. They enjoy doing it. And it's a nice technique, especially when there is a problem with the iris and you cannot put an ACIL or there's a problem with a cornea or there's glaucoma. So that becomes mainly your main choice. Uh, Chris, please. So um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the whole idea of, of, uh, uh, of glaucoma. Um, so this is a patient with glaucoma, and, the, and our goal here was to try to place uh, the uh, scleral sutured CZ70 lens without opening the conjunctiva. And this is how we did that. So we make a seven millimeter uh, near limbal uh, triplanar wound and uh, fill the anterior chamber with viscoelastic. And uh, then we're able to just kind of rotate the, and, and, and flip the lens up. And this is the patient's status post retinal detachment repair. And I'm making two sclerotomies transconjunctivally in the iris plane. And I hand a loop of Gore-Tex from one forcep to the other. These are MST forceps into one sclerotomy and out the other leaving these two loops of Gore-Tex dangling in the anterior chamber. And we turn the infusion down. We take the IOL out. We externalize both Gore-Tex suture loops, making sure that they don't get twisted or tangled. The uh, orientation of the sutures here is really important. We make the girth hitch. We take this big CZ70 lens that has a seven millimeter optic and, um, and put a girth hitch around each seven millimeter optic. You're seeing I'm not going through the eyelet. I'm going around either side of the eyelet and that gives me beautiful four point fixation. Then what I do is I go through the conjunctival opening and bring both of the, uh, bring the Gore-Tex suture loop to the more counterclockwise sclerotomy, tie it, close the wound with a running stitch and do the same thing on the other side. We, we, with a little bit of tension, you rotate the uh, IOL as far counterclockwise as you can. And then with gentle tension on the more counterclockwise suture, you, we tie the Gore-Tex. And then once we're done, now we turn the infusion back on and we rotate the knot intraocularly. There's always some viscoelastic in the back of the eye and of course the viscoelastic in the front of the eye. And uh, these eyes end up doing beautifully, beautifully well. That's what they look like post-op day one. They recover very quickly. Um, so I, I love doing it that way. The only downside to doing it that way is that uh, the only downside to doing it that way is with a near corneal wound, you can get after, after you pull that stitch. So I leave that stitch tightly tied with lots of astigmatism for four, five, six weeks. And then I pull it because then the wound is nicely healed. But I've had a few patients where when I make it a near limbal wound as opposed to a proper scleral tunnel, um, where you'll get late slippage uh, of the wound and a little bit of astigmatism develop. Um, so in this case, I really wanted to preserve the conjunctiva. That's why I didn't make a scleral tunnel. That's why I made the corneal wound. Um, and uh, I'll just stop nice. here. I've tried this technique and it's really very nice because the problem is the patients come complaining of the irritation from the vicar sutures from the conjunctiva and the eye doesn't look very good. But uh, maybe just my advice for starting surgeons, I don't know, Chris, if you agree, make at least a conjunctival opening on, on one side, at least a small one. Because when I try to bury from like no opening, in my hands, it's difficult. I, you know, it, it is it is definitely a little bit tricky. Mm. Uh, it's definitely a little bit tricky. Um, and, it, you know, in this particular case, you know, honestly, I'm much faster if I open the conj and then close it because of exactly what you're saying. But in this case, I really wanted to preserve the conjunctiva yeah. for, for, for some glaucoma procedure down the road, um, which we were able to do. Um, but there's no reason why you can't open the conjunctiva and then close or it. Or at least, Chris, on like one of the knots where you're going to bury. 
just yep. one of the knots, which I found that easier. I'm doing that now, and the opening is very small, and I just glue it. It's, yep. it's a very neat way of doing things. Right. So uh, that's very nice. So can you can you show us another case on that? Or sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so Chris, 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 if you don't mind me saying. You're an artist. That was a piece of art, you know, amazing, amazing surgery that was. Well, thank you, thank you. I appreciate your kind words. Future looks beautiful. So this here is a very, very interesting case. This is a patient that has almost complete aniridia. You see he's got an endothelial corneal transplant. Um, he's got an epiretinal membrane that looks like maybe a 2060, 2080 epiretinal membrane. Um, the cornea is clear. Um, but the visual acuity is count fingers at his face. And the reason it's count fingers at his face is that the previous surgeon that, uh, that, that sutured this acreos lens into the eye um, sutured it much, much too tightly. And we were able to show with a pentacam that there was horrible, in addition to the phaco burn that, that you'll see in just a minute, we were able to show horrible, horrible lenticular astigmatism because of these, uh, be, because of the uh, the acreos lens being sutured too tightly, so we made the decision to do an IOL exchange, and put in one of the human optics artificial irises um, to help with this nice man's glare. So he started off at count bear, just a little bit better than hand motion, and I'll let it play now. Um, so we're uh, we're opening the conjunctiva, exposing the previous Gore-Tex sutures. Here you see the phaco burn and the mangled uh, uh, area where the uh, 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 iatrogenesis imperfecta originated um, at St. Elsewhere. Um, we, uh, so I've got a kind of going in a, it's, you know, in, at a weird angle. Here's my scleral tunnel that I really prefer to do for, for, for any kind of IOL cases. Um, we uh, open the uh, wound to seven millimeters, and here's my two sclerotomies, um, uh, two sets of sclerotomies. So here's one set with a loop of Gore-Tex uh, in one and out the other. I'm using this uh, this uh, toric alignment marker to really make sure that I'm that I'm 180 degrees away uh, with the uh, opposite sclerotomies. The the conjunctiva is open here, as we had just talked about. And again, another loop of Gore-Tex into one sclerotomy and out the other sclerotomy. Now watch what happens as I cut the Gore-Tex. One, two, three, boom. You see the tension that got relieved? That's why this eye couldn't see. And so we cut the other Gore-Tex. I've got the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the offending lens in my forcep. We remove it. We take the old Gore-Tex sutures out because I'm a little OCD. We measure the anterior chamber. We externalize the Gore-Tex suture loops. We put our girth hitch around the IOL, um, uh, the IOL haptics. We put the IOL into the eye, and here I could have made my my wound a little bit larger. Um, and I'm um, speeding this up here again to show we rotate as far counterclockwise as we can, tie it, rotate the suture knots inter internally, and this is the artificial iris. Okay, so I measured the anterior chamber and determined that I did not have to trephine this artificial iris. It would fit just fine in the sulcus. I pass two Gore-Tex sutures through the artificial iris. I open it up. This is color matched to a uh, index photo from the other eye. And you see that I'm recycling the same sclerotomies here to, to, to paste, place the artificial iris suture fixation. The artificial iris unfolded uh, upside down, unfortunately, but uh, we were able to manipulate it back into place and uh, again, suture the scleral wound. And now um, we, we rotate the artificial iris clockwise and bury the knots intraocularly, recycling the same uh, uh, set of sclerotomies for both Gore-Tex sutures. Then we do a nice uh, scleral depressed exam to make sure we didn't create any badness, close the conjunctiva. And this eye came back to uh, 2080, maybe a dirty 2070 in this uh, 90 plus year old man. So that was a huge victory. The cornea survived this surgery um, and, you know, in terms of clarity and he, did, he went on to do really well. Chris, very nice, very nice, so beautiful. So for uh, people, uh, custom iris is coming now, is actually in the US and more and more there, there's some improvement with like uh, coverage from an insurance point of view. 
um, and it has yeah. been available in Europe before. It's it's very very exciting. Um, um, I think that as retina doctors, we're going to end up putting in probably about a quarter to a third of these, um, and and the remainder will be put in by uh, by our anterior segment colleagues. Um, it kind of depends. In, in some cities here in the U.S., there's there's uh, aggressive and gifted anterior segment surgeons that do a lot of the suture posterior lenses and and anterior segment reconstructions. Um, and, and in some cities, it's the retina the retina doctors that do that. Um, but the key thing is, is that this is, you know, it, it, it reduces glare, it collimates, it creates pupil, it reduces irregular and uh, astigma, uh, astigmatism, it reduces higher order aberrations and, uh, and patients and, and gives a great cosmetic result. We never put these iris implants in for cosmetic purposes just to change the color of the eye. That's absolutely unacceptable and unethical. But um, for a functional patient like this, to take them from an, a, a horrible abnormal pupil to a normal pupil um, and, and, and relieve his glare complaints, plus give him a decent cosmetic approach, it's a wonderful way to reconstruct these eyes. And like, and like Ahmed said, there's coverage now and, and Medic there's Medicare codes uh, that go into effect actually uh, July 1. So we're excited. Very nice. Uh, so question here uh, on the, sorry, a question from the audience on the uh, artisan lens. Uh, Philippe, uh, do you have any problem with artisan lens and silicon tamponade? Have you done that? No, but I do not think that there should be a big problem because again, it's an acrylic material. Uh, so it should not stick. It should be like any other uh, acrylic lens. Uh, again, I don't know if anybody else had an experience with that, but I've, I've not. And have you done it with gas? I mean, yes. Yeah, you put yeah. it while gas is there. And yeah, it's it's they just behave as a, any normal sort of the fake it. You yeah, know? I think it's it's good if you're gonna put gas. It's most likely best to be put posteriorly as you put it because then you're away from the cornea. And T-chamber IOL with gas sometimes doesn't behave very well. Um, okay, well it's uh, very good. I'm concerned about uh, just aware of the. Yeah of these hydrophilic lenses that can happen. So the Acros, which is a, a great lens, you know, there is, it is possible they can become a pacified with, with gas. Yeah, and are, we'll, yeah that's yeah. a good point. And we will touch on that. Can I ask you, in terms of that, is, uh, is the panel here, are you tending to use more hydrophobic lenses in comparison to hydrophilic? Because again, that's one thing that came out to light couple of years ago, and I think that that's one of the main things for us VR surgeons, and we should be using probably more hydrophobic lenses than hydrophilic. Is that is that all of you? Are you doing the same thing? Strongly agree. I mean, the problem is until recently with the Invista, um, uh, the Acrius was the main lens used, or at least like the other like smaller lenses used, so, and the Acrius is hydrophilic, and that's the problem. So I think Invista that we're going to touch on a bit is a good option, or maybe the uh, large diameter lenses that uh, uh, Chris is using. The, um, and Chris, can I, ask, can I ask Chris a question? You know, sure. you, had, you had the lens the, on the second case, again, a beautiful case. I, I, I need to come and learn from you how to do these cases because it's a work of art, that. But your second case, you had an Acrius Adapt lens, which you had it inside the eye, everything ready to go why did you ex why didn't you use that same lens and you know relax the situ replace new sutures to relax the, you know the tension instead I was, of I was, yeah i was making new sclerotomies anyway there were already some early opacifications in that lens okay um and uh and i had to make a pretty big incision um uh i i, I already had to make an anterior segment incision not a huge incision uh, in order to get the artificial iris in. So you can put the artificial iris into a uh, into an AMO cartridge, but then you still need a three and a half millimeter incision to get it into the eye. So for me, and, and this is this is an interesting philosophical thing. So the downside to the large CZ70 lenses um, is you have to know how to make a good shelved triplanar wound, and you have to know how to sew to close that wound. Um, I have gray hair. I know how to sew and I know how to make wounds. Um, so I'm, I, I feel comfortable with that. I totally understand why many of our colleagues are, are using foldable lenses 
um, because you know all of that throwing and all of that suture and all of that spaghetti makes a lot of surgeons uncomfortable, and I, and, and I totally get it. Um, but uh, so for me, again, I, I'm, I'm well within my comfort zone doing a case like that. That was actually my first one of the, the with the artificial iris. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, so yes, we could have loosened, we could have cut the Gore-Tex. You, there's a wonderful technique that Mike Snyder has described where you can take a proline suture and actually put it through the Gore-Tex. So cut the Gore-Tex suture, relieve the tension on the Gore-Tex suture and actually, uh, a, 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 and then reattach the two cut ends of the Gore-Tex with a little bit of extra proline in between them that you, that you tuck on the surface of the retina. You can do that. And I thought about it, especially because this fellow was older, but as soon as I started, as soon as he was uh, very interested in the, in the artificial, in the iris prosthesis, um, I said, you know what, I'm gonna do the very best optical job that I can for him. And, uh, and it ended up panning out real well. Thank you, Chris. Uh, one other question as well, if you don't mind, Ahmed, sorry to, to no, you know, no. manipulate, again, you've got a lot of experience. I have very little experience in comparison to you with the Gore-Tex uh, sutures. When you manipulate the Gore-Tex sutures, I found that when you, you know, pull on them or do a lot of manipulation, they you, they get misshaped and, you know, they lose their their look and their structure. And I feel uncomfortable about that because I don't know if I'm weakening those sutures or not. What, what so can that's, a, that's a really fantastic question. And it's an important question, right? Because, um, and I'll show a little bit later, you know, we've all had to deal with, you know, what's the option if we're not going to use Gore-Tex, we're going to use proline. And with proline suture, uh, we, we know that there's an epidemic of these broken proline sutures, um, even ninoproline. So I've been using Gore-Tex since, um, since 2003. Um, I've never had a Gore-Tex erode internally. I've never had a Gore-Tex break. So Gore-Tex, the, 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 the CV8 Gore-Tex suture is dental floss, right? It has a tensile strength that's probably, you know, between 10 and 100 times greater than that of the, uh, of the, uh, of the proline. Um, you can do almost anything you want to that suture other than melt it uh, with, with heat and, and it, it should hold and, and it incorporates nicely into biological tissue. The key things about the Gore-Tex suture is that it's very, very slippery. So, and you didn't see that in my videos uh, because it's just, you know, it's boring to show a bunch of knots, but I do, I do uh, three, one, 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 one eight ones on top of the three because it's slippery just like dental floss because well it is dental floss and um and and uh and, and those and those knots can untie go ahead ask me how i know that <laughs> i have been read about it in a journal article no it, it's happened to me and, and it might be best to hold from the knot right chris because that's really the advice always to try to hold from the knot or from the ends of the knot rather than the main suture itself. That's how they handle it in like cardiac surgery. Right. Yes. And and you have to be careful because when you hold when you hold a big knot with the jaws of the forceps, the forceps don't completely close and there's a and there's and there's a gap that makes it hard to pass through the through the sclerotomy. So you're actually better cutting the cutting the tails a little bit long and grabbing just the tail. Yeah. And, and, and using the tails to dunk the knot into the, in, into the eye. That's very good. And, and, and the key thing is, is that there's all sorts of stuff that's published out there about putting it, putting the knot intrascleral and putting the knot, uh, and putting the knot uh, on the surface of the retina and covering it with a patch graft and da 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 The only way I have been able to avoid erosions, because Gore-Tex knots erode over time um, through conjunctival erosions, is to put them intraocular. If they're not intraocular, you have a risk. Uh, it's not a high risk, but you have a late risk of conjunctival erosion. They make the and, and then can you get your, your video up and, as we can continue this discussion? Philippe, you have a question. Go ahead, please. It's a comment, actually. It's very encouraging to know that you've been using them since 2003 because my I started a couple of years ago. And, you know, when patients ask me how long will they last for, so now I can probably tell them my friend Chris in Cincinnati has been using them since 2003. And have you had anybody that eroded to a point where the lens, you know, 
dislocated like the proline ones or you've never had any problems with the Gore-Tex ones? Never. The only, the only erosions that I've had has been knots that I've not placed into the eye. Okay. Um, I had one Hoffman pocket erode externally and I had, uh, and I, and I've had, and I used to just leave the knots on the surface of the globe and cover them with a, with a, with a Tudoplast patch graft. And I, and I had a bunch of those erodes, so I don't do that anymore. It can cause a granuloma as well. So yeah, I, yeah best to be buried. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, can, you, can, you see, can you see on the screen there? Yes, that's beautiful. Oh, good. Right. So um, um, I'm, I'm moving on to some chariot fixation lenses. Yes. Um, most people probably know about this technique. Uh, it involves uh, two to three millimeter uh, scleral tunnels, uh, two to three millimeters behind the limbus, um, and externalizing three piece IOL haptics out through these colostomies and, and potentially burying them through tunnels. Um, when you read the Shariath original paper, he talks about this being elegant and easy, and it's not always so easy to do. <laughs> so, um, 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 you know, when you watch people's videos like Chris, you feel very inadequate, but I, I think everyone will admit that there's there's a lot of learning in all these techniques and nothing is, um, nothing is all straightforward. Here I've got a, a, a young guy with Marfan syndrome with an ectopic lens um, which I'll try and skip past the fragmentone bit. So yeah, so um, his lens um, was prone to dropping and it did drop. So then, so opening up the conjunctiva, I, I you know, I, I, um, I think it's really nice to see what you're doing on the sclera, personally, um, making corneal marks uh, so that you, in, in, you reduce the risk of you going uh, putting the haptics not exactly perpendicular. This is a couple of millimeters as opposed to two and a half millimeters from the limbus and a couple of tunnels and then a, a 25 gauge uh, blade to make sclerotomies and then tunnels. Um, and then this is a uh, sensor lens, which is a three piece injected lens, partially injected into the eye, leaving a haptic just outside the eye so that you've got control of it. You might see some forceps there, in theory, grabbing the. Um, these are straight to try forceps grabbing the tip of the, the, um, the haptic, and then um, externalizing it through the sclerotomy, and then a similar maneuver for the proximal haptic, um, which you can manipulate it through the cornea, sort of a hand shaking technique, and then you can see there grabbing the tip of the haptic um, out through the sclerotomy. Now this is superiorly. Now, that is all fine. And then um, burying them into the tunnel. Again, you know, it, it can be a bit of a fiddle um, to get that through the tunnel that you made very nice and tight so that it doesn't move around, but it's so tight that it can be a challenge to get through. Um, when starting this technique, don't be fooled to think that it is a piece of cake. It's, it, it, it's, it's like everything, it's a, it's a challenge to learn. So these are the curved forceps. So the curved shower forceps are, are nice to use to to go through your tunnel to externalize it. Uh, I'm a little bit paranoid about hypotony and I think it's nice to suture, uh, suture hold shut. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a Shareth one. Um, this, is, this is a similar sort of, I'll be very brief with this one. This is a, an eye well that is dislocated. This guy's minus five, was made to be minus five. And as Chris showed in his first video, he's got a dislocated lens that's important to, to um, free it from the vitreous. And then because he's minus five in both eyes, um, I wanted to fix the same IOL into place. And this is already a three piece IOL. So a similar sort of process of making some tunnels. In this case, I use valveless ports to help um, grab the uh, to help grab the IOL and then feed them through the, uh, uh, with crocodile forceps, which are serrated forceps through the holes, through the sclerotis that are made. And again, sort of a hand shaking technique that, to help grab the tip of it the haptic out. Um, and this guy, therefore, we, we were able to use the same IOLs that he came with, um, but put them back into, into the position that allowed him to see. I'm just going to finish, Ahmed, if you don't mind. There's lots of complications with these things that I seem to have had experience with all of them. Um, and I'm only going to uh, discuss one of them, which is tilt. So with these two-point fixations, I, I feel that there is, there is always room for tilting around, along the axis of the IOL that's put in the eye. And, and when IOLs tilt, 
you get wave front aberrations, usually coma aberrations, which if this tilts enough, it is difficult or impossible almost to put the refraction and it can be quite symptomatic. Um, and so in some circumstances like this one, um, you, you do need to remove them. Um, you can see that's significantly tilted. Uh, here we've exposed the, the haptic. And I think I thought that if I just move that along, pull that haptic through a bit, it'll be perfect. But it's firstly adherent, which is the point of the tunnel. Um, finally, we've managed to move it through the, the intrastural tunnel, still tilted, you see, and got anywhere. Um, then, I, then I opened up the other, the other um, haptic, tried to pull that through, still tilted. And I thought, well, maybe if I make an incision in the cornea and then I sort of rotate it manually, that will do it. Um, it, it was unable to be untilted. It, it just got more and more tilted as, as, this, as this process went on and on, no matter what, what, what we did. So you can remove these eye wells just from the anterior segments, so without a vitrectomy, without infusion, filling up the eye with visceral elastic. First, you've got to un unhook the distal haptic, secure it in the AC so that it's so they won't drop, and then using a, a hook of your choice, then unhooking the, the proximal haptic, and then taking the the eye well. Once you've got a haptic out, you're secure, and then you can take the eye well out, and then you can put in, you know. A nice anterior chamber lens at once. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's my problem with these lenses. I think two point fixation, they do a tilt. Um, any any question? Any co let's see an, uh, let's see another video on the same technique, and then we can have questions. Abdullah, can you please load? Yeah, I got yeah. the presentation here. Thank you. So I'll show uh, again the Chinese technique, which I, I, I like very much uh, for uh, sphere of fixation. Uh, I came across uh, this patient. It, she had a previous retinal detachment, so she's already vitrectomized, and she had a late haptic lens, which already dropped, dislocated to the back of the eye. So I, in that situation, I decided to make a scleral tunnel, about uh, 5.5 to 6 millimeters scleral tunnel, and I planned the Charius tunnel in advance uh, in my mind. So uh, first I opened the conjunctiva as usual, and then I made the scleral tunnel uh, about uh, six millimeter uh, in size. I like to mark them in most cases. This is actually shorter like what an, uh, I normally do, but because I wanted about two millimeter from the Limbus, I want to uh, mark for this clear fixation. This patient is already vitrectomized, so I just did a check for complete vitrectomy, and you can see the lens is settling in the back of the eye and moving freely. So the next is to grab the lens. And uh, what I normally do is just to grab them with the forceps, try to grip it from the fibrosis capsule. If you grip, the capsule from any part, it will hold really nicely with the serrated forceps, and then I bring it to the front part of the eye, shake it to the other hand, uh, hold it with the forceps, and I had, the good thing about the scleral tunnel, you can easily remove these lenses without any further manipulation, so with the other forceps, I hold the lens, and I explanted it outside the eye, it came off nicely, uh, following that, I plan the Charius tunnels. I like to do them a little bit longer, usually around three millimeter. This slightly makes them more anchored. So uh, I put the M, uh, this is an MA60 lens from Alcona, 3 piece lens. And then I close with the inverted suture. So yeah, here's the fashioning the tunnels. So. Uh, I do a little bit 3 millimeter or 3.5, so this gives us better anchor uh, on the scleral side. And then I made uh, two bars in pieces. So like what a man showed earlier on, just to try to grab it from the haptic as much as possible. And here I externalized the first haptic. Same way, here I used a, a 25 gauge needle rather than an MBR, and you can see a little bit long tunnel about 3, 3.5 millimeter. And then handshake the haptic to make it ready to grip it from the smallest pyrotomy. 
And I try whenever possible to hold it from the very far tip. So to avoid any kink in the haptic. I'm using here normal 25 gauge forceps actually from Alcum. And then I externalize. And sometimes it's also useful to hold the other haptic from the other side because this tension sometimes disengages. So I'm getting another forceps to hold the first haptic and then I'm externalizing it. And then the next step is to thread these haptics into the scleral bucket. It can be fiddly sometimes, but what I found that the superior one is really easy to thread through the sclera, and I'll try, uh, always try to go all through the tunnel. The second one, I found it much easier, like what Amanda did, just to grip it from the other side, rather than to thread it. So you have, in that situation, the lens is nicely anchored at three points. You can see the lens is very well centered. It's also good to check the centration, with this five millimeter uh, bubble, the lens is very well centered. And another final check for the fundus. And then you end up just closing the conjunctiva with two suture. And as you can see, the lens is really well centered. And then the conclusion of the surgery is subconjunctival antibiotics and still. Yeah, that's it. Well, that is a fantastic, th those are two fantastic surgeries. Um, I, I have, uh, I have uh, two questions. Question number one, do we think that intrascleral plastic is going to be tolerated well long-term? My feeling, it, it works well in most case scenarios. And actually, as you know, recently, the Yamani technique, uh, the same, or previously, the fibrin glue, you can use the clear flaps and the fibrin glue technique. So far, is it more or less they are doing well? So we think we've seen a couple of we've seen a couple of Yamani erosions and we've seen a couple yeah. of these tunnels erode. Um, and 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 sometimes you know when they when they erode, especially the Yamani, um, it, 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 they show up with a with a horrible end up fomitis. They erode and it's it, it's yeah. I've um, and you know with an intraocular Gore-Tex knot, I've never had that happen. So I, I and I do Yamani and I'll show a case in a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I worry about intrascleral fixation. The second uh, question I had is I noticed that you used an MA60 lens, uh, yeah. and, uh, and, and, and I've, I've done the exact same thing uh, plenty of times, and the MA60 lens is a great lens, but I've gotten into trouble with the MA60 because even though it's a three-piece lens, the optic of the MA60 has square edges, okay? and yeah. And, and you can sometimes get an UG and iris transillumination defects and inflammation and CME from an MA60 or an MA50 that sutured into the sulcus. So I, I've, I've migrated to, uh, to, to, to a Z9000 series or an AR40 or, of course, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the Zeiss Sensar lens. That's just beautiful. Um, and those haptics are, are the most robust that are out there. So I'm... I'm tending to if i can and i can't and depending on where i'm operating sometimes they don't have those lenses um and i'm and, and i use an ma60 which is com uh, or, uh, which is completely reasonable but i tend to move away from those alcon lenses it's interesting what you say about oh, so i you know as i said I, I've, I've had the misfortune of you know of having to deal with a few of these things and oh, is, a, is, is a, i think is a real thing particularly with these, these square edge things and it's very frustrating because um, it causes a lot of damage, and um, uh, it does make me think. You know, th these lenses are not made for these purposes. These lenses are not made; they're made to sit in, 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 the, in, the, in the in the capsule. Actually, we then adapt them to put them in the sulcus. And now we've adapted to to putting the PMMA haptics through sclera. The, the design of the optics isn't made to be right up against the iris. You know the, I, I share your mild concern for the long term of these lenses because they're not they're not being used in the way that they were designed. The, the CZ70 single piece, the haptics around the optics is optics around. It's a seven millimeter optic. It's got a thirteen and a half millimeter cord length. It's very very forgiving lens if you're willing to fall on the sword of the larger wound and the sewing that that, that that's inherent in putting those in. Still got one 
So it's only still got one eyelid, hasn't it? So you know the it, the, the the other lenses like the Acrios, which are flat. Intuitively, I feel that those lenses that have four haptics are just just you're less likely to get you know tilt. So, but that's that's why I use the girth hitch. I don't use the eyelet except for to separate the 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 the, the two loops of the girth hitch. And that gives me beautiful four point fixation. Yeah, and I think that always has been a problem, really. With square fixation, has been there for a long time. But the main problem was like the two point fixation, it just the tilt is very bad. And we removed a lot because of the tilt. Uh, Chris, do you mind uploading your presentation, the, your Yemenian Hoffman? Sure. Why do you say that, Ahmed? Go, go, go. If you want to upload Chris for the sake of time and. Sorry? If you can upload, Chris, the Emani and the Hoffman, yeah, get like your share screen. So uh, I'll add a little bit to your comment, Chris. Yeah, there, there is a concern about uh, threading uh, a Berlin haptic into the sclera. But actually, part of this iris chafing is usually okay. Part of it is due to the tilt. That's yes. what I experienced with the Yamani technique. The problem with the Yamani technique, the interest clear tunnel is very short. And the other thing, you can't control it. But the good thing about the Sharius method is that you can do three millimeter also. You can adjust it a little bit if you find the lens is slightly decentered. So you can build a little bit one of the haptics. And I tend to do at least two millimeter from the limbus. I know some people do 1.5 millimeter, but I feel two millimeters, at least two millimeters is good enough to avoid any bubillary touch. And, but again, on the long term, there's always a concern with distance here. Yeah. 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 No yeah. doubt about it. Well, yeah. One thing, Chris, is uh, again, and Aman and Abdullah, I, I totally agree with what you said. Uh, I moved away from doing uh, using this technique. One, because again, the long term, I was worried that we know from experience that proline would erode. So I thought that, again, the same thoughts would apply to, 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 to the haptics of these lenses. Secondly, the lenses that I have available in my unit are the MA60, and they, you know, they were very, very tricky to manipulate. And thirdly, I used to get the first haptic very nicely in, and the second haptic, it gave me such a bad headache that I just said, I can't, I can't put up with it. So bye-bye, Skariok, bye-bye, Yamani. I'll leave it to you to do, and I'll stick to my, my, my preferred methods. <laughs> and I think I think that's a that 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 is a a brilliant and honest summary. You know, I I wouldn't say bye bye to these to to all of these techniques because because there are instances where it's really nice to have that in your toolbox. I usually don't plan to do those primarily, but um, like I had a case not that long ago where I was going to do an exchange with a sutured CZ seventy, and in the middle of my vitrectomy. In a in a minus you know for thirteen diopter myope, and the patient developed uh, you know uh, uh, the patient developed a suprachoroidal hemorrhage. Well, obviously that's not an eye that I'm going to put. Uh, obviously that's not an eye that I'm going to make a seven millimeter wound into. So I was able to you know, quickly recycle that lens, put it in and Yamani it, and, and you know raise the pressure to one hundred and twenty, quickly Yamani it. And it worked, and I got away with it. And it was nice to be able to have to to, to have that in my toolbox. Um, but primarily, I, I you know I, I I like other things. Um, this case here, that's actually an interesting segue into this case. So this is a case of a patient that had a suprachoroidal hemorrhage in the other eye during routine cataract surgery. Uh, a high myope presents with uh, with a lens on the macula. Um, uh, after after uh, several months after complex cataract surgery, and I'll let it play here, um, and and this, and here again, I'm, I'm I'm lifting the IOL with suction from the cutter. I, this is this case. The video is a little grainy. This is one of my very first uh, 3D heads up cases um, that I did back in 2011, actually. Um, and you see here, I have an MA50 lens. I'm putting the Gore-Tex girth hitch around the uh, lens. Haptics. Um, I, I I remove the IOL from the anterior chamber, and I'm making Hoffman pockets here because I really don't want this globe to be open for a very long period of time. Um, and uh, so Hoffman pockets. You you I use a 550 blade to make the uh, the, the tunnel, 
the reverse bevel tunnel. Um, the Gore-Tex needles are very, uh, are, are very blunt. They're actually uh, vascular needles, so they're hard to pass through sclera. If I had to do this again, I would do a handshake with a needle. Um, but I can fold the lens, and here, remember I said make the wound a little bit larger. I was all about making the small wound here, folding the lens with an old lens, lens folder, lens inserter. Um, and now I'm taking the Gore-Tex suture, and I'm passing it through the conjunctival opening that it came out, back in and and out through the Hoffman pocket so that the that so now we're through one and a half thick one and a half scleral thicknesses of of uh, of uh, 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 holding holding that Gore-Tex suture I can tie the Gore-Tex suture I tuck the Gore-Tex knot into the Hoffman pocket this is really sexy it worked really well for this patient I don't do this except for in extreme cases anymore um, you know, it was nice to be able to use a foldable lens and not to have the big the big wound. The patient didn't get a super choroidal hemorrhage, um, and 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 that was you know that was a nice way to do it. Does anybody use Hoffman pockets? I don't. Uh, I don't. No. But I might. I might yeah. be part of my repertoire. <laughs> well, it, you know, it's it's. I think uh, Philippe is saying this because you said it's sexy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in magic stuff, we like sexy stuff. Um, hang on, where is? So we have a question until you get your uh, your other video, Chris. About uh, okay, uh, this is maybe a question for Philippe. So if you have a posterior lens artisan, you need to remove, but I'm not sure why you need to remove it. Have you ever tried that removing a fixed posterior artisan for whatever reason, and how to do that? Yes, I removed one, and that was quite a while ago. And uh, so where do you hold? Do you hold like I showed next to the? So I, I, I basically, I'm talking about the posterior one. Yeah. Basically, I, I picked up, I picked it up with the with the artisan forceps, the and basically I, I found it very easy. I just again went with the with the iris hook, went through the haptic followed the loop until I found the gap and disengaged. And I thought it was going to be horrendously difficult. I've done only one case and it went very easy. So I don't know, you know, if I if I anchor it in a different way, if it's going to be that easy. But I found it very, very, very easy. That, Thank that. you, Philippe. Chris, please proceed. Yeah. So this is an interesting case. Uh, this is a 15 millimeter white to white. This is an eye with megalocornea. It's had retinal detachment repair, multiple previous surgeries uh, at St. Elsewhere multiple iterations of IOL repositions. Um, they ended up suturing it to his iris that worked for several years. Um, and then uh, and then the one of the iris suture prolines broke and this lens is dangling into the into the uh, vitreous cavity. So um, of course this guy is anticoagulated on Coumadin and on Plavix. So I'm trying to use a minimally invasive approach here. I'm 27 gauge, as you see, um, I, I, I get as much capsular material off to really expose the lens well. Um, and uh, you see, I, 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 change the, I change the bevel. I decide that I'm going to actually use the, um, I'm going to actually use the, uh, the I, don't, I don't have the little thin walled 30 gauge needles in, in this operating room. So I'm using the 27 gauge trocar. Um, and, uh, and here, so, uh, you know, I, I pull, pull it out. Now watch what happens when I pull the second haptic out. The first haptic gets pulled right back into the eye. And, uh, and so we have to go back in and, and fish it out. And, you know, and it's fiddling work and it's frustrating. And these Yamanis, you know, they, they show these sexy videos. Um, they're fiddling. They're frustrating. Um, you know, it, this case ended well. Um, you know, and, and it was, it's nice to have the, you know, we were able to recycle this three-piece lens. Um, and, and then, you know, we just put a bunch of conjunctival sutures in to, you know, and, and, and close. And he went on to do well. But, um, you know, I, I still worry even a minor trauma could, I think, easily dislocate this lens back onto the, on, onto the macular surface. So. Very nice. Philippe, can you get ready with your uh, 27 elegant uh, Acreos Gordic lens? Well, actually, it's not that elegant now after those videos that we've shown, especially the Gore-Tex ones. It's going to be a shame. Um, it, it's, it's basically 
I'm going to show you two videos of when I started doing Gore-Tex and then made, made it a little bit more sexy when I got a little bit more experience. So, <laughs> as Chris said. So, let me just get it up. I think the, the first video is going to be my my first uh, or second, no, my second case. So this is my first case. Uh, you can see from the start, it starts, it, it's already looking not that great. Yeah, very bloody. <laughs> uh, so basically I've done the conjunctival, uh, you know, uh, incisions. Let me just one second, where am I? Let me get this out of the way. Now, sorry, sorry, sorry. So I've done the conjunctival incisions. I've uh, marked my landmarks and uh, my Gore-Tex suture there. I'm looping it through the Acrius Adapt lens. And uh, I'm picking up the loops. I'm, I usually tend to use um, trocars because I find it more easy for uh, manipulating. This is 25 gauge, I think, it wasn't 27. So I've got the lens there, ready to go. Uh, again, make the wound big. I'm trying to go through a small wound and look at my life there, shoving, shoving, shoving. But again, I ended up putting it in. And it that was probably my, my, my second uh, case. Again, it went well. One of the things I have to say is with Gore-Tex and this type of technique, be careful and be aware of where the loops are, where the ends of the, the you know, the, the, the sutures are, because believe me, it's very easy to get entangled. And I ended up with one case where I ended up with some, uh, some one side twisted in one way and the other twisted, and I didn't even realize until after I finished the case and a few weeks later, I said, bloody hell, what's going on with this lens? It looks all, you know, <laughs> twisted on one side and the other. So just be careful. As I said, experience gives you, uh, you know, the, 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 the thinking uh, for other cases. So this is my second case. And this is, I think, one of my other cases that are weeks later I said, hell, what's going on with this lens? It looks all, you know, twisted on one side and the other. So, hello? We got you. Thank you very much, Felipe. You just got interrupted, but we can hear you now. Okay, sorry. No worries. This is, this is a, you know, a little bit more controlled, everything a little bit easier to manipulate, you know, what's going on. It's, again, as I said, the important thing of these cases are to mark your loops and know what's inferior, what's posterior, what's left, what's right. And uh, once you get, you know, going, it's, it's, it's easy. But as, as everything, you have a learning curve that you need to be aware of. So that, that was, you know, a much more sexy way of doing it, as I said, than what I did on my, on my second case. And I'm not going to tell you about my first case because I used <laughs> A bigger Gore-Tex suture than what I should off, and and the, one of my colleagues thought that I was using a, a fishing, you know, <laughs> uh, basically uh, rope there. So, so these are these are the cases of of Gore-Tex. As I said, I I have Yamani, I have everything, but I just veered off of doing it of, of doing them because I think again those other cases just are a little bit more controlled uh, in my hands. And again, I'm very, very happy to hear Chris that he's been using Gore-Tex since 2003. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's still, you know, things are still moving on and, and no no major problems, which is encouraging. So, so and I'll, I'll jump in here. I've been using it since 2003, but I have partners that have more gray hair than I do that have been using it since prior to that. Um, and uh, it, it, uh, uh, nobody at the Eye Institute here, and we do, a, you know, we're at quaternary, tertiary quaternary care center, um, and nobody is afraid of using Gore-Tex. That's so. right. Thank you, Chris. That's great. great. It's a lot easier to manipulate than pro proline. Proline's like horrific. Yep. Very nice. So I'll continue with the accuracy, and then we can have questions as we go. So uh, this is the way I do it, and I 
try to make things easy for myself. So I go about, I make marks and I go about two millimeter from each mark and I go backward four millimeter to get iris clearance, clearance because this is actually a one piece lens. You don't want this to be chaffing against the iris. Uh, so, and I use an in the bag calculation. So that's what I tend to do. And I try to get things organized from the beginning. In theory, as well as you'll see in a minute, I put the infusion cannula. So I have five uh, sclerotomies done and I just keep it this way. So it's, it's very simple. Then uh, if you have any work with the procedure segment, best to finish it and search the retina before you put the accuracy IOL because we know that this lens will may opacify with gas. So you don't want to put it if you have tears or uh, or detachment. Then the next thing here, where you got, you can see the five uh, trokers, which I tend to use it this way, is I tend to thread the Gore-Tex suture as I hold the lens in the uh, in its manipulator. I just find it easier, and I do that with the needle on, and then after that I cut the needle and I put it in, and I try to be very organized. Uh, so I always do the inferior one first. Uh, on one side, I try to do the nasal first because it's more difficult. Mm -hmm. And this one has a bigger wound that I close because I explanted a, a PMMA lens. And then I do the uh, other one. And the trick is always to be outside your first suture. So you're, and you'll see that with the other one. So here I'm doing the other side on the temporal side, and when I'm doing the superior one, I need to be outside that suture, and then there will be no spaghetti. So <laughs> always be on the outside and do the inferior one first, and there will be for sure no spaghetti. And if you have a big wound like I had here, close it initially, and then fold the lens. I try to inject the lens with the sutures, but I fail completely. And here where you need to manipulate the anti chamber really, uh, or the infusion where you have to put it on and, and off to manipulate things and make sure you don't really take your um, suture out as you do this. And then I use um, an adjustable suture and I keep playing with the tension until I'm happy. So I would go to the other side and adjust until I'm happy. And then after that, I would lock it. And then uh, I, how many knots have you done, Ahmed? Uh, I do three, but I mean, having heard Chris now, maybe I should do a bit more, but I tend to do three. Okay. Three, so, one, one. Yeah? I got a bit worried. I do three, one, one. Yeah, because I and, usually do three and that's it, but if they slip. Yeah, if, and then I hold from the knot or from the tails now, and I try not to manipulate the suture itself, and I dunk it in. Uh, and here, I try to avoid that now as much as I can. And then if I think that the, the port is big, I would suture it because of hypotony. This is a common re issue. Uh, and then after that, I, I modified my conjunctival opening, but I actually glue it. But now I've modified my conjunctival opening, having seen uh, videos of Chris. Uh, but uh, glue works well as well. And if the glue is not holding, I put a couple of sutures. I try to avoid multiple sutures uh, damage of this so and I, I see I find that really works very well so I wondered if um, Ahmed what I tend to do and I fold it is I tend to just put the inferior um, Gore-Tex loops out through the sclerotomies and leave the proximal to not through the sclerotomies because I, I just feel that when you fold it and they're all they're all hanging out the eye and you've got a folded eye well and you're putting it in there's a lot of thread there to get lost in and it's all tangled up and it's all in place and if they get tangled up and then you pull up, I just feel having two out the iron two. I agree and I used to do this but until I figured out that if you uh, redo it this way you will never get a spaghetti if you're always like outside your first suture on that side uh, but I think the important point that you're trying to get across a man and me too as well is Make sure you don't get a spaghetti, whatever way you do it. Just make sure you don't get tangling. And one other thing, very, very important point, I think, is that when you're manipulating these sutures or you're feeding them, use serrated forceps. Because right. I use the, the, the ILM forceps, right. and basically you're trying to feed yourself grip a little, you know, yeah. 
they're floating, so it, you make your life much easier if you use serrated forceps. And, and they're like they're like stilettos, those island forceps. They, yes. You know, yep. you, you, they're so sharp. They're, they're, if you grab them, they'll rip the thread, and they're more likely to miss it. You know, you're yeah. more likely to, whereas if you've got a nice crocodile forceps, you know. Ano another uh, trickery that a colleague of mine here, and he has a very nice video on... Um, um, on the American, uh, on the AO uh, uh, website, is he uses a flexi loop to hold the to snare it. when using 27, like to snare it, and that tends to work well as well. This is here just to show uh, this is a case where a patient had the acris lens, had a retinal detachment, and during his vitrectomy surgery, uh, the suture got cut. So that's how to secure it. So I go here and it's easier to do this outside a troker without a troker and I'm actually feeding the haptic through uh, with the forceps. And if you do this, it's much easier to do it uh, without a troker. Yeah. Uh, and then you do the same thing from the other side. And then you're in, um, you're, you're fine. Uh, and then this is here. This is another case as well where actually I was pulling the suture out. I was doing Chris technique here and I was pulling the suture out and it all came out. So now uh, I need to thread the side again with the lens being inside the eye. So um, this here, because the lens was like anteriorly, you can actually manipulate it from an anterior wound. So I did the same thing, but I did it here from the corneal wound and actually was easier, but same thing again. It's a good thing these videos don't have audio. Yes, yes. <laughs> and then here, and then I just want to show here, this is my, what I do now is the conjunctiva. I have an opening only here, and I don't have an opening here, and I do the way that Chris was doing, because I found doing it without an opening is a bit tricky. It is. Uh, in my hand. So then you can, re so you have a very small opening that you can close with one or two suture, or I glue it. But it's very nice because these patients used to come with very, very red eye and lots of irritation from the vicral. So I'm really, I, I really like it this way. But Anna, do you not need to then, do you leave that inferior sclerotomy that you've threaded the Gore-Tex through, do you leave that unsutured? Yeah, I think if you dunk, you leave it unsutured unless there's hypotony then you suture, but usually you would leave them unsutured. So or, you can, or you can do a partial air fluid exchange in a lot, and that mitigates the hypotony. But then the problem is I try to avoid air with these lenses yeah. because they yeah. can opacify. But yeah. one of the things I found with Gore-Tex as well is that, you know, to start with, it might look very flimsy, very thin, but a little bit, you know, a few minutes later, it expands again and it fills up those sclerotomies. Again, I use very small, I use 27 gauge. So, mm. That's my experience with 27 gauge sclerotomies. That I've never stitched any Gore-Tex, you know, sclerotomies. I think 27 gauge particularly would be would be better position. It's slightly difficult with dunking. That's my experience. Yes, that's true. So that's I true. think I think for especially for those who are hearing us re or watching us now, yeah. just not, it's very good to understand all the pros and cons, and then after that you do what works for you. You know, 27 for example, nicer with the hypotony. Uh, uh, the new forceps are good, really, or you can use the uh, flexi loop, uh, but then dunking becomes a little bit tricky. Um, how, I how, yeah, I, how far you could see uh, active score point fixation from the limbus? Uh, I, so this is here. So I go four millimeter from the limbus, and the reason really is to clear it from the iris, and so there's no iris chaffing because I worry about iris chaffing, and also I use an IOL in the back calculation. So that's how I do it. I make a mark two millimeter on each side and then four millimeter backward. Does it affect the final refraction if the lens is four it millimeter? It depends on which one you use, right? So I use the IOL in the bag calculations. Okay. As if you're putting it in the bag. So I, I want to jump in here. Um, th these were just beautiful, beautiful Acrios videos. Um, and, and there are a lot of fans out there of the Acrios lens. Um, and, uh, and, and so I'm personally afraid of the Acrios lens because um, I don't have the touch that the two of you obviously have. So I, I, I love the, I, and I mean, and, and what I mean is getting the tension of those Gore-Tex is just right. 
Um, the uh, you know the adjustable knot I thought was very insightful. I'm going to try that actually, um, because the problem with the Acreos lens is that it's got a 12.5 millimeter cord length. Yeah, and and if you're going and 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 if it's a you know 14 millimeter uh, uh, sulcus, and you're four millimeters back from you know uh, from each sulcus or maybe two or three or whatever it is to, you know, internally. Um, you're really creating artificial zonules. And if they're too loose, then you'll get a floppy lens that'll that'll knock around and, and give you an UG. And if it's too tight, you'll have the situation that I showed, you know, that I had to fix in, in, in my case. Um, there are some folks that have the knack and can get that tension just right. And the two of you obviously did it masterfully and, uh, and, and, and bless you for that. We, so, we don't show you the other videos, Chris. Say again? Don't show you the other videos. We're going to get it right. <laughs> yeah. um, did you find, um, Ahmed, the slip knot um, that the Gore Tex does slip because the you know um, braided sutures don't slip very well? Um, uh, and I found I found you doing a slip knot for the Gore Tex a bit more tricky. It, it's not braided. The Gore Tex no, is not braided. No. It is slippery. It is very slippery. slippery. Yep. I, I don't find it difficult at all. On the contrary, it, it works very well. And the idea is that you get you want to just try to get the right tension. Of course, it's not science free, it's experience, and you try to get it right. And you don't want it to be so loose and you don't want it to be tight. And I find this sliding not so you very useful, really. I really so love it for that. I put my scrotum is a bit closer, um, in the region of three millimeters from the and yeah, I, and I think that's fine as well, but I feel I feel like clearance from the iris 3.5 millimeter to four is important with these lenses. Finally, I just want to, if we can, you know, touch base on this lens, which uh, Chris actually told me about it when we were talking, and I went and I looked it up, the Invista IRL. So uh, the idea is that this is a hydrophobic lens. So it wouldn't really opacify as happens with gas and the accurate lens. So it's really nicer on that. My only concern, but I have no experience. I have not used it. Chris can talk about it a little bit. His colleagues use it. Is I feel it's still as a two-point fixation. Uh, it just, um, you know, it's you come out to four point, but the lens as well is, is held by just two point, three, one point on each side going through the loop. So I don't know what do you feel. So... I, I uh, my, my I, I've got several colleagues that swear by this lens. They love it. Um, I uh, I agree with you. I think it's two point fixation if you yeah. use it the way it's the way it's uh, the way it's illustrated here. But you be, but because this this uh, that this hole in the in the haptic insertion is so large, there's a neat little trick that you can do where you take a loop of Gore Tex through that hole. Open up the loop, put over, put it over the end of the haptic, <clears throat> and then tighten it down. And what that what that does, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> what that does is that <coughs> moves the, the 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 two gore the the loop of the gore tex to either side laterally of that very large eyelet that's in 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 at the uh, haptic insertion, and that gives you a type of four point fixation. That'll get the lens to untilt. So I've got uh, Mike Hader is a colleague that, and 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 Luke Linzel are both colleagues that that have done that, and they and that that now use a loop through the eyelet and over the end of the haptic in order to get it. That's the way I rescue CZ70 lenses that have fallen into the back of the eye. Right, I'll, right. I'll take a, I'll take a little Gore-Tex loop. I'll put it into the eye. I'll twist it together. And and feed it through the through the eyelet, then open the loop, put it over the haptic, and 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 to suture refixate. Um, that works here. I've never done an Invista. Um, for me, the the down I, again. I'm I'm not confident that I can get the tension right. And and just like for with the Acreos, you really need to get the tension just right. If it's too much, you can get erosions. You can get uh, irregular astigmatism, you can get lenticular astigmatism because all of these IOLs are designed to be compressed. They're not designed to be pulled on. And when they're pulled on, um, you can get uh, you, you can get all sorts of weird, uh, 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 irregular, funky uh, optical uh, anomalies, a coma and 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 un unrefractable patients. Yeah. yeah. 
I think that's a, that's a good point. So again, we discussed this for completion, really. So maybe the audience can look that up and see, really. But uh, the worry is, as Chris uh, said, with all these uh, um, um, uh, acrylic lenses, and also from my side, I think it's still a two-point fixation. Um, that's the, but it's a hydrophobic lens. Uh, there's a question from one of the uh, from uh, Dr. Haider Fosini here asking about uh, Car Carly Valley lens. Uh, I don't have any experience with it. Does any one of the panel have any experience with using this lens? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. All right. So we don't have experience using the lens yet. Yeah. My government is protecting me from that lens. <laughs> yes. But I, 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 am, I am a bit worried, Ahmed, with, with the two-point fixation as well and the tilting of that lens backwards and forwards. That, that's my feeling. I feel like... You know, we st I used to do, and I worked for someone, Rob Johnson, or the late Rob Johnson, who used to do loads of scare fixation, and we stopped because of all these tilts. And then I came back with the Acris, and I really love it because of the four-point fixation. So my worry is still as a two-point fixation. Hopefully they can get an Acris-like, but hydrophobic. So maybe can we have a final word of uh, wisdom from everyone? So we'll, um, let's start with Aman. Aman, a word of wisdom about Afakia and IOL to conclude with. So, things, so as you know, I've got a lot of interest in Marfan syndrome, so I've, I've thought about this for a long time. You've not touched on contact lenses. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely, that's the first thing I always, all my Afakia patients, I ask them to try contact lenses because that's, that's the first thing. That's um, a very good point, actually. Yeah. We should not forget about that. Yeah. Stuff, but, you know, we mustn't forget the contact lenses. That's an option we should give to the patient. That's first I, always, I always make them do it first, and I want them to fail the contact lens. Before <laughs> and and some, some, people, some, people worry about, some people worry about having intraocular lenses displays in the posterior segment floating about. I've not seen anyone that had a, you know, a perforated retina or anything from any dislocated. I don't know if you've had that experience, but also I think that if the patient is elderly and they are able to cope with a contact lens and they don't want more surgery, yeah. so a lens in the posterior segment is not always uh, a crazy option, as Aman said. So, and one point as well about contact lens is that it's good to test the water to know what's the vision like, right? So especially that you don't want to uh, go for a lens and then, the, and then you're not really sure about the retinal function, especially if patients had surgery before. So really good to test the water and get the patient to experience what the vision would be like if you put a lens in. Chris, do you have a word of wisdom on that? On, uh, on the aphakia and IOL correction? I, I think that, um, you know, if, if you do a literature search on, on, on this subject, you will get hundreds of papers with hundreds of different techniques. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the and what that tells you is none of them really works really well. Um, you've got to you've got to assess your own skill set. You've got to assess what's feasible to do with your nursing staff and your scrub staff, and and what instrumentation you have at your disposal. And and uh, the good news is that there's a lot of options out there. The bad news is none of them are great, and you just got to do what works best for you. I would strongly encourage the younger doctors listening, okay? Us older doctors, we know how to sew and we know how to make wounds because we, we, we came up um, learning at least extra caps. I really didn't do very many extra caps, but I know how to make a, a, a wound. Um, go, to the, go to the lab, take a pig eye or an animal eye and just practice sewing and practice making your wounds that's what turns you into an ophthalmic surgeon. And as a retina doctor, you want to be an ophthalmic surgeon. If you, if you make the effort to do that, it's not that much time in the grand scheme of things when you compare it to how much time you've trained to be where you are now. You will never, ever regret improving your sewing skills and improving your, your, uh, your lamello dissection skills for wound creation. Thank you so much, Dr. Raymond. Abdullah, any uh, final word of wisdom? Yeah, actually, I totally agree. We haven't reached the ideal technique for clear fixation or correction of aphakia so far. Each technique has its pros and cons. So my recommendation, the first one, is always try to do the one which you feel has the least manipulation. In my case, I, I like a lot of the artisan retrievability because I feel it's a very quick surgery. My second choice is often the chariot technique, 
especially if I do uh, a little bit longer uh, spiral box spiral tracks, I feel more stable, but still, each technique has its pros and cons. The second thing I often tell my colleagues, especially anterior segment surgeon, whenever possible uh, during any catch tract surgery, try to preserve the anterior capsule. If the lens is dropped, no problem. If there's vitreous, no problem. Just the least manipulation, preserve the anterior capsule because if the anterior capsule is damaged, uh, I mean the anterior capsule rexis, which normally should be intact. If it's damaged, you move the surgery to another category, which is a clear fixation, which is again, there's no ideal technique for it. Thank you, Abdullah. Philippi? Uh, well, you, I mean, you've all said, uh, you know, everything that needs to be said. Basically, keep open-minded, flexible, and also continuous learning. And thank you very much, Ahmed, for, for making this meeting possible because I personally have learned a lot from Aman, Chris, Abdullah, you. So it's great. Great. And thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, today. And thank you so much for our audience. Sorry, Chris. You were uh, this was lovely, and uh, and and you know, it's it's wonderful that uh, you pulled together a bunch of us from from different backgrounds, and uh, I learn. I always learn more uh, from these than I teach. So thank you to everyone. Thank you so much, Chris. Very kind of you. And very kind of you all. And uh, for our audience, thank you so much for staying with us. If you have any questions, still put them on the website and the, uh, the YouTube channel and the Facebook. And please do subscribe to these channels. More courses will be coming. Thank you so much, all. Marvelous. Thank you. Thank you.